Greetings, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Topic UFO. I am your host, Rick Schooler. And on today's show, we will be speaking to Mr. Daryl Sims, a.k.a. The Alien Hunter. Daryl has approximately 40 years of experience, uh, both in ufology and alien abduction phenomenon, alien implants, etc. And he's also part of the current television program, Uncovering Aliens, which uh, can be seen on both the Science Channel as well as the um, Animal Planet Channel, if I'm not mistaken. So Daryl will be here to uh, talk to us about uh, those subjects, and I can't wait to hear his thoughts and theories, simply because of the amount of experience he does have. And I'm sure he'll be able to uh, provide some uh, additional information as well. All right, we will be back in just one minute with Mr. Daryl Sims. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Hey, Mom. Yes, you. Why fuss and fret about dinner? Why not have it right here? Yes, this drive-in offers everyone in the family a real picnic treat for dinner. We've got delicious sandwiches with all the trimmings and your other dinner favorites, plus whatever you want to drink, hot or cold. Come early before the show starts, or eat while you're being entertained, or at intermission time. So why fuss? Give your family a tasty dinner at this drive-in. Welcome back, everyone. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and bring on our guest for the evening, Mr. Daryl Sims. Daryl, are you out there, sir? I am. Glad to be here tonight. Hey, Daryl, I tell you, uh, I'm always fascinated uh, when somebody has so much background in ufology. You're looking at, what, almost four decades of being involved well, in this? <laughs> you're making me older than I feel. <laughs> That is correct, sir. And another thing that I find fascinating and something that we talk about often on this show is the fact uh, of these uh, visitations uh, that seem to come at a very young age, right around the four to five years of age. And, and you have that as well, correct? That is correct, sir. I've... Uh... My event started when I was uh, about four years old in Midland, Texas. Uh, my mother was stunned when I explained this to her one night. She's, she was, says, well, that's impossible. I said, Mom, she said, you can't remember that. I said, Mom, uh, I, we lived on 1005 South K Street in Midland, Texas. You want to know the phone number? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the question that, that we often talk about here is, you know, why is it this four to five years? year old range that keeps coming back up. Do you think that has any significance or do you think that's just because as human beings, that's as far back as we can remember? In my opinion, and based on 40 years of work, um, I, uh, my, my assessment is that uh, one of the best times to begin programming someone is when they're quite young. Oh. And when you do this, that causes the individual to uh, be very malleable uh, very uh, believing children tend to uh, buy into what they perceive as an adult or someone that's over them uh, to be an authority. And once that program begins, uh, they literally are at the behest of their captor. I understand. I've never heard anybody uh, explain it that way, but it makes complete sense. Now, now, Daryl, uh, I'm sure most of our, our viewers either have heard of you know you quite well, uh, have seen you on television, uh, your your latest show, uh, uh, Uncovering Aliens, which uh, was on, uh, I guess it's still on right now, right? It was uh, in January? <laughs> yes, sir. It's, it's, all, it's all over the, it's still running all the time. They, I don't know why, they just keep putting it on all the time. I get calls from people all the time on the show. You have... <clears throat> I guess, proclaimed that that Earth is some type of farm planet. Is is that correct? Well, it is for them. It's not for us. Uh, for us, it's home. Uh, for them, it's a, it's a place of experimentation uh, that they're doing. 
and it's uh, various things, uh, of most of which we're kept in the dark on, literally. In fact, these so-called beings of light do their work at night, in the late night, often with children, on up to people who have already been programmed and working that program, uh, many of them unaware. We call them abductees or contactees. And these people, in effect, uh, uh, sometimes even resist the program, sometimes fight it. Uh, certain others uh, fall in love with it. Uh, I call the contactees or the people who like the beings. They think they're here to save the planet, fix the ozone hole and all that, nothing of which they've done in the last 6,000 years. <laughs> and the other people, the abductees like myself, know they've been abducted. It's a crime. It's called kidnapping where we come from in Texas. We're a little more clear about that. And uh, I call these people the, the, the uh, killer bees because they will not take it, so to speak. If you come to steal the honey from a a honeybee, they'll sit there and uh, think the funny little man in a white suit is here to help us, and and uh, he's he's stealing our honey because he's supposed to. They don't know he's never he's not supposed to be doing that. And the uh, the killer bees, the abductees like me, uh, when they see the little funny man in the white suit coming, he's going to be in a lot of trouble if they can do something about it. You said that you your first uh, visitation or abduction. I'm not sure what what it was. Uh, at around age four, did you have subsequent visitations after that? I did. Uh, the subsequent, in, in, uh, I had about 10 events uh, from age four to age 13. Hmm. And uh, this ended, my in, events ended at age 17 uh, violently uh, one night, an event that uh, where five entities came into the room, uh, did not wake up any of my family, broke the door. Uh, and the doorknob was laying on the floor, literally, the next morning. No one heard it. Uh, I was the only one that was wide awake and uh, experienced the event. I ended up with uh, broken ribs that my D, with the, the best way to say that is that my uh, VA uh, primary care physician found my broken ribs, uh, told me about them, and I told him I couldn't have any, but it's impossible because if you have broken ribs, you'd know it. And he said, yeah, you wouldn't even be able to hardly breathe. And I said, that's true. So why would I? Why do I not know I had broken ribs? But on my x-rays, you'll clearly see that there were broken ribs there. So why did this this particular visitation get violent? Was it because you were resisting? Well, I think many abductees do resist. Uh, most of the time, the entities will simply override your consciousness and uh, basically you'll knock you out and they'll just do whatever it is they're going to do. Uh, but what most abductees and contactees don't know is that you can override that if you know how to do it. You just simply have to train yourself. I figured this out at age four when the entity in my room uh, tried, the last thing he tried to do when he when he was leaving was try to make me uh, forget the whole event. And the only thing I would remember, he changed his image into that of a horrific clown. And, um, and uh, I kept shaking my head back and forth, no, 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 because I wanted to remember him for what he was, not for what he wanted me to think he was. Uh, what What are they doing here? What are, What are these entities doing here? Are they, you mentioned this farm planet experimentation on humans. Uh, have you found out that they are from a certain area in the universe? Are they multidimensional? Uh, do they come from inner earth? What's up with all that? That is uh, the that is the that whole question is this is the is the question that uh, I'm answering in my next book called Hierarchy, which goes into the full explanation. Of that I'll try to give your audience a, a a thumbnail sketch of what I think and what and and you have to realize there are many theories out there by all these different people. Right. And that, that those theories are a dime a dozen, and so is mine. If I give you a theory. But whenever we have evidence to point to that, because I'm a former uh, a police officer in the military for three years and uh, worked in the Central Intelligence Agency in covert operations for two years, been a private investigator for 30 years, still prosecuting felony crimes, uh, like uh, 42 of them in the last three and a half years. My point being is that I have an investigator background. So I take off my UFO hat, which kind of is all excited about everything in the world, and can be fooled real easily, and, and my UFO hat gets fooled just like anybody else's. Uh, people fake things, lie, and all kinds of stuff, <clears throat> or they misidentify it. But the fact is, when I put my cop hat on, the world changes for me radically. It believes very little, and it's looking for mistakes and all kinds of things. So when I start looking for evidence in the question, who are they or why are they here, 
my answers right now, after 40 years of investigation, have become uh, uh, pretty sharp, and uh, it, it alarms some people because they realize that I'm not making this stuff up uh, to sell a book. It, it's, that's not my purpose. The entities, in my opinion, all the entities, is, uh, even let me frame this a little differently. <clears throat> if the question is asked, are the are these how many alien races are probably visiting planet Earth? In my opinion, probably none. None. And of course, the, the question comes back. Well, it, but but they're here, and I said, well, of course they are. But it's, well, these aliens are from whatever Banlon. I said, uh, Banlon's a a, clo a cloth. I mean, so, or a planet planet band that they claim to be from. That's that's a deodorant. What are you talking about? I said, they're <laughs> messing with your consciousness. I said, what well, what you have to do is take off your UFO hat, UFO hat, and not be um, overwhelmed by them or or their stories or whatever, and simply look at evidence, evidence like this. When you look at the entities, all seven of them lined up, there's a seven, if some people call them the seven races that are visiting planet Earth. I said, they're not races, they're models. It's like uh, going to the Chevy uh, company and looking at the Corvettes and other models all the way down to the Impala. You're looking at models, you're not looking at races of beings fr from anywhere. I said, first of all, look at the, look at the obvious. The obvious thing is one of the entities is a human being that some people call the Nordic. The fact is he's a being that looks very human. A little bit different, but quite. The question is, where did somebody get that DNA to make him? True. Number two is uh, if there's another being called a reptile or reptilian, where would you get reptile DNA? You're not going to get it probably from Mars or Jupiter or some other star. You're probably going to get it planet Earth. The place to harvest the DNA you need to create the beings you need that you can call aliens is right here on Earth. So you get, well, what about the Bigfoot? Uh, the Bigfoot guy has actually been, DNA work's been done on uh, recently, and they found that he is two things. One, he is obviously ape, an ape-like creature, simian. And the other thing they found, is, which is rather startling, but is consistent with my thesis, is that his DNA is modern human being. Not Neanderthal, not Cro-Magnon, but modern man. Somebody has created, manufactured, hatched, or cloned, or made this thing and placed it on, on Earth for a period of time. And he is, in fact, a part of the DNA that you and I are. <laughs> so, and it goes on and on and on. But so, the DNA of the beings come from Earth. So, so what you're saying, Daryl, is, is pretty much Earth is like this giant Petri dish that these whatever they are, are using to stir up their their different experiments and and coming up with different forms of life or models of life, is it? Well, someone is, and it's not the alien. The one we'll refer to the alien is the seven primary uh, creatures, uh, the greys, uh, doctor type, and, and the mantis being and so on. Again, where do you get mantis DNA? Probably not from Jupiter or any other place out there. You're probably going to get it on planet Earth. Someone came here long ago, got the DNA from these various creatures, and they manu took them back, the DNA, let's say, back to a craft here. What it, and I'll use, I'll use this because I can actually back up some of what I'm saying here, but the, for brevity, we'll just give you the short version. So we got the DNA of these di different seven different things, took it out to uh, this, the big craft, so to speak, a very large one, and this is where they do their operations. It's, I mean, it's it's... It is just surrealistic. And the entities then are reintroduced back on Earth uh, through various uh, spacecraft. Uh, you can call them UFOs or whatever. These entities then come here, have their interactions with human beings, and, of course, they refer to themselves as aliens. The fact is the entities probably don't even know where they came from or what they are. And uh, they're, they're given a, a viewpoint that they are, in fact, um, entities from uh, from another planet, and they may even believe that. But well, uh, I don't find any evidence that it's true. Well, you know, you said that these uh, aliens may not know uh, who they are, where they came from. That's pretty much like us humans. <laughs> right? <laughs> Every time I go downtown and get lost, I figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how long have we been asking those two questions? Who are we and where are we from? Uh I don't know. I don't think anybody has given the definitive answer yet. That's for sure. So, well, so yeah. what you're saying is there is some ultimate power to be 
that is over these seven different types of aliens, uh, you know, in a, in a short, uh, explanation is, uh, so would this entity that's on top, that's, that's, that's creating these entities, how would you explain, uh, that entity? Is this some sort of, uh, master race or, or, uh, what could it possibly be? Well, uh, there, there's two. There, there's two, two opinions primarily that you can think about. One of them goes back to a guy named Sitchin who wrote about this, and others did too. Did a lot of uh, work in the area of the so-called Anunnaki, and uh, Anunnaki were beings that, that that according to ancient history came down from heaven, and uh, that according to Sitchin came down from heaven and earth, and then they, they basically su subjected human beings to uh, slavery is what it amounted to. That's the ancient record. However, if you go back to a, a better record, in my opinion, which is a biblical record, uh, you can find uh, the same story, but it has a little, little bit more better de definition. And it doesn't say they came down from the heaven. It says they were kicked out of heaven. In fact, the ancient writing actually states that, that they were kicked out, thrown out, ran out, any way you want to call it, they were not invited anymore to stay there. And whoever they were, that some people refer to them as fallen angels, some people say they're the Anunnaki, uh, but the, the fact is, whoever they are came to Earth at many years ago in ancient times, and they did a number of things on Earth that created some real problems for, uh, for, uh, for heaven, for where they came from, and also from people on Earth. They, uh, they are the progenitors of the uh, of the giants uh, in ancient history uh, a fact that uh, the skulls and some of the bones and things have already have, have actually been noted and seen by by people and and even in history uh, the, the Gen Jewish general historian hit, uh, in the Roman times uh, in the days of Jesus literally uh, stated that the bones of the giants could still be seen in his day in the Valley of Rapa Wow. So they were responsible for that, too. A lot of genetic engineering went on uh, all through history, and the alien is simply part of that program to present them to us as if they were from other worlds and to basically get you do whatever it is they need done or want to do. Wow, strange stuff. I, I tell you, every time I think I've, I've got my hands around this subject, um, I talk to someone like you, and, and now the... Uh, subject just goes deeper and deeper uh <laughs> my wife tells me there's nobody like me <laughs> i don't know whether it's a compliment or not <laughs> well if she's still with you daryl it's probably a compliment uh, so. 44 years yeah uh, you you can't beat that yes sir so daryl let's i'd like to switch gears here just a second and and ask you about something you did back in 1994 where you were invited uh, to speak at an American Medical Association conference. Yes. Now, how did that come about? Uh, you know, having a, a alien hunter at a medical conference just <laughs> yes. seems a little bizarre to me. So how did that all come about? What oh, did you yes. talk about? What was their sure. response? Glad to, glad to speak about it. Uh, my, my first answer to that is... Um, I uh, was uh, speaking at a conference in, uh, this was in uh, Atlanta, and while I was there, I got a phone call from Dr. Lipson, a uh, doctor who owns uh, a couple of uh, medical facilities at the time, a friend of mine, and he says, uh, Daryl, how'd you like to speak to an AMA-sponsored program for continuing education for doctors, surgeons, and so on, about 250 of them? I said, absolutely, yes. And he said, okay, I'll set it up. What's the title of your presentation? I mean, it happened this fast. And I said, uh, give me a second. Oh, medical complications of alleged human alien contact, colon, implants. <laughs> wow. So I did a medical presentation, 250 of these surgeons, and they're sitting there, I mean, literally uh, aghast. They just did not know what to do. They were so stunned with the evidence that I did give. After the event was over, uh, three of them came aboard to... Uh, to uh, offer assistance. That's amazing. That really yes. is. Um, now I know, uh, you know, recently we, we, uh, just lost, uh, Dr. Lear, 
uh, of course, who, who did a lot of uh, implant uh, surgeries and, and stuff like that. Uh, have you found uh, pretty much the same uh, or come to the same conclusion and found the same type of, <clears throat> excuse me, evidence with these uh, implants that Dr. Uh, Lear had? Not really. Uh, oh, really? Uh, Dr. Lear, uh, first of all, Lear was not an MD. He was a podiatrist. He was a foot doctor. Right, right. He, right. So he didn't remove a lot of these implants at all. He uh, he hired someone to do it, which I do. And uh, <clears> then <throat> and so he did a couple of foot surgeries, but that's it. Uh, but anyway, uh, he made some claims that were off the chart. Let me give the history real quick. Uh, I've been I discovered implants in 1960 at age 12 because I I was in the was in the event consciously and I got an implant myself. That's how I discovered it, not because of any brilliance, but simply because I was present. Number two is I, uh, in the late 80s, uh, I began to study implants uh, very openly, and uh, 1992 made an announcement about implants and uh, the fact that we already uh, had one, and uh, people were like stunned. And then in 1994, I did my medical presentation where I made four major uh, uh, astounding uh statements about implants, what would happen if we implant, if we do a surgery on one of these people with this medical evidence I'm showing, these x-rays and scans and so on, that uh, certain things will be true. Those four things turned out to be absolutely true at the first surgery. The first, I met a guy in um, California, his name is Roger Lear, and uh, he did not believe in any of this stuff. He thought we were all nuts and crazy and all that. And uh, his friend, uh, Alice Levy, a really wonderful lady, uh, uh, begged him to come look at my evidence, and he looked at it. Was uh, he still thought it was all nuts? And uh, I, uh, I flew, I paid for, and flew two of the patients out to California, and he did a foot surgery on one, and we hired an MD, or he did, hired, claimed it was an MD, came in and did the hand surgery. Long story short, is uh, the next morning when the uh, pathology reports came in, he was absolutely totally stunned, and uh, we just. Uh, he said, how in the world would you know all this stuff about implants when no one even knew they existed? You not only know they exist, but you gave us four med things that were medically impossible, and they were absolutely true when we removed the implants for the foot and the hand. And I said, you had to have had to been there. And said, anyway, <laughs> Roger Lear, um, yeah, Roger Lear finally, uh, after several years we were together, uh, a number of clouds came up around him, and uh, I kept asking him if you ever had any medical problems with, uh, you know, with metal, medical boards or anything. He just kept telling me, no, no, no. And I found out that, number one, that was not true. So he, uh, some of our, our reductees claimed he, the implants were missing uh, under his care. And uh, that, of course, is uh, anathema to me. Um, so uh, anyway, after the state of California came after him for malpractice, and uh, the, in fact, the attorney general showed up at that hearing, by the way, and I have a copy of the entire report, so I know what I'm talking about. I told him, you said, you told me this, and you didn't, you weren't involved in any of that, and and here you are, they're they're coming after you for malpractice, and they did, and they got they got him. And uh, so anyway, I said, uh, I want I want your resignation. I'm firing you right now. And he uh, said, okay. And th anyway, he went off and did his own thing for a while, and that's fine. That's perfectly fine. But he came up with a lot of uh, conclusions that were off the charts. Nothing. It, it, to me, it was junk science at best, and I, I just could not uh, agree with the implants. First of all, are not tracking devices; they're not they're not transponders. Uh, these devices that we've found actually uh, 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 they indicate because we don't. There's no real science to that yet. It indicates that some of these uh, objects uh, seem to have the ability to manipulate uh, your neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, potassium. What that means to the average person is. If somebody is in control of those neurotransmitters in you, they own you. Yeah, it's like being on a drug, on being controlled by a drug, right? Yes, sir. It's uh, it, they literally make you ha sap happy, sad, or whatever. You're, you're the show is theirs. It's not yours. Now, you know, I remember one thing that I always found fascinating uh, with something Doctor Lear said. Uh, during one of his interviews, is that they measured some type of uh, frequency that came off these implants. I think it was like 14 point something megahertz or something. 
and that 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 this frequency would stop uh, once the implant was removed. Is there any truth to that? Well, I can I, I can't I can't speak to uh, all of his stuff, and I I had some of his patients actually come to me later uh, disenchanted with their own uh, complaints and so on, and I and I, I won't. Uh, I'm not interested in trying to create a right. controversy, uh, but the, the answer is that the uh, the headline that he pronounced many times uh, simply was not uh, provable. There was no science. In fact, when doctors, and I have some emails from doctors and scientists who asked very pointed questions about his claims, uh, he never would address them or answer them. And uh, that, that that's uh, really anathema to your, to research with your, if you're, if you're doing this research and you've come to some conclusions and everything, you better produce the science for it and not just uh, I was alone in a room and had a, a, a little tiny uh, a gauss meter and it seemed to go off really well. Well, those things tend to go off because of lights uh, overhead, uh, traffic, even even some traffic that comes by uh, or, th- or or any time you get it in any near any other electrical equipment. I mean, all kinds of stuff. depends on how sensitive it is. And the ones that he was using, I could, I know, I saw it. I, <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, well, I, so, but I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I guess, I mean, we can say without a doubt that these implants do exist, right? There's no question of that. They, they certainly do exist. Uh, we've done, uh, uh, I've done total in my, with my medical team, I've done uh, 24 surgeries to date. The last one being in Flint, Michigan uh, last year. And uh, some of the most amazing implants, period, I've ever seen. Uh, like one of the claims that Roger made was uh, all these implants are on the left side. Well, they're not. The implants that he studied that were on the left side were the ones, the cases that I gave him to look at. And he wrote that in, in a book. He later wrote a book and said, oh, well, all these imp- oh, the only ones, only implants he ever saw were the ones that I showed him in my cases. And only several of those that he saw implants were on the left side. But the fact is, the implants are on the left, right side, middle of the body, uh, in the scrotum. The, they're uh, in the genitalia. They can be in the head. In on my book on implants, uh, literally, you, there's one the size of a uh, a lifesaver inside this woman's skull on the X-ray. Wow. And two, yeah. Two years later, it moves to the other hemisphere, the other side of the brain. <laughs> And then one day it disappears. And uh, now she's got one in her arm. If you go to my website, alienhunter.org, and click on there's two videos there. One of them is an implant. A guy's got an implant in his finger at, at, at the Roswell Museum where I'm doing a presentation. And the other one is, is the lady with the implant in her head. Now she's got one in her arm. You can watch the video like, right, right there. <clears throat> now, one thing you do say on, on your website, uh, Daryl, is that these implants are extremely rare. That's true. I, 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 I really get upset when I read on the internet about everybody that's been an alien abductee who's got an implant and you're, you're, you need to you know, get your local psychic or whoever to check you out. <laughs> uh, that simply isn't true. Uh, I, I, I see hundreds of x-rays every year, every year. And uh, the vast majority of these do not have implants. They have an object there, and I assure you that uh, that we operate on all kinds of people, and uh, and you have to understand that I do this uh, for free. I do this uh, every bit of the work I've done in the alien abduction world uh, has been uh, absolutely free. Our work is philanthropic. Uh, I don't have a lot of money, but what I have, I either beg, I either spend my own or beg, borrow, and steal whatever I can from doctors or others, or universities, labs, wherever I can, and uh, and uh, anyway, we just get it done any way we can if we feel the case is viable. And uh, I, we have, we're just not in the money-making business. This is about real right. evidence. We're, we're, not, we're after, not after somebody's money. Is there a certain type of person, a certain type of personality uh, that seems to, to get these implants more than others? And, and besides this, this controlling of uh, internal body chemical, is there anything uh, else that these implants are, are doing? The first uh, year that uh, that I reported an implant was 1992. Uh, we I knew of implants before this, but I kept it quiet because I wanted to be sure. When you make this kind of statement, you you're gonna, everybody's going to come after you, so you have to be very careful. Uh, 
I made a first public announcement about that 1992 about an ocular implant that we had from a mass abduction of eight people and uh, to, from two states and several cities. And an amazing, incredible story. Um, but the bottom line is this implant fell out of the lady's eye and the next day at work. <laughs> and uh, we have it. And the, the point is that the object appeared to be a about the size of a grain of sand. And it has a, um, it, it, in my view, had a, uh, a bio, it was a casing for a biological camera. It was attached to her uh, optic nerve. Uh, anyway, that seemed to be the case, and uh, the, everything that she said uh, indicated that as well. And uh, so that one wouldn't be there to monitor. It would be there to spy on other people. At a meeting she was at, by the way, uh, during – it was a double mass abduction. It happened on December 8, 1992, and it, uh, they came back and got him again. They were going to uh, do a number of things, I guess, to them again. The same group of people in two states and several cities on December 11, 1992. And uh, they got the biological contain the the biological camera out of it, but they didn't. They forgot the container, and they lost it apparently. And you know, she rubbed her eye the next morning; it fell out on her desk the next morning at work. And her boss saw it, and that's how I retrieved it. So this is two years before I ever met Roger Lear. So <laughs> these could be multi-purpose devices, right? You think they the the implants are multi they're they're some of them are multiple purpose and some of them are very specific. Uh, I have a little girl that had four little gold spheres in her nasal passage. And her mother uh, had gone to a, was at a conference of, where a presentation where I was doing, telling people how to look for evidence. And, uh, and, <clears throat> and I said, if someone ever complains of something in a nasal passage, have them sneeze into a Kleenex if possible and just see if there's anything you can find immediately. And she did with the little girl after the little girl told her, Mommy, Mommy, there's a strange little man with large black eyes came in my room and did something in my nose. <laughs> and she found these four little gold spheres. And the mommy lost them. They were sm so small, they're about the size of a pinhead. And she dropped them in the carpet. <laughs> but uh, several weeks later, the entities came back and put four more in the little girl. And I have those four. And they were studied at York University. Now, was, was there some type of... Uh... A molecular makeup uh, test done on these things? Uh, any data that come back on that that you can share what these things are made out of or consist sure. of? The, we found, uh, overall, we found a number of things about implants. There are some implants that are, these particular four were made out of 51% uh, gold and 49% silver. Uh, a metallurgist who is a, uh, he's not an assistant metallurgist in the university, he was a tenured professor. And he said, "I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to replicate these. I'm going to make exact copies of them." Uh, and I said, "Go ahead if you can." And he was amazed. He was not able to to replicate them. He said, "I'm, I'm really amazed that I cannot replicate the surface and everything, the aspects of this, these four little spheres." And uh, but we did find that out. The next thing we're going to do is send them off now to a lab to uh, have them looked at to see if we can find out the. Uh, the signature of the metals, uh, each metal that you find on Earth has a signature. Uh, that just as a, an example, you say a 212 uh, gold uh, has a, an atomic signature of 212 as an example for your audience. Uh, but if you look for gold and you find it on the moon as an example or in the meteorite, which there is a huge meteorite there full of gold out there. Uh, if you found gold there, it is highly likely it's not going to be from here. And it will have a different signature even though it is gold. That's how we know meteorites come from outer space or a rock that we found in our Antarctica came from space because we've already been to Mars and we found the signature of the uh, metals there and we, the meteorite they found in Antarctica, it had the same exact signature. So we know that meteorite literally came from Mars. Oh, wow. That's amazing stuff. Amazing. Well, listen, we're, we're getting down here on time, Daryl, but I, I wanted to talk a little bit, if we could, <clears throat> about your the television show, Uncovering Aliens. I really liked the show. Uh, the re One of the reasons is I thought the team that you guys put together was really good. Uh, I, I, I love the way they interact. Uh, but you know what? There's one thing I could tell about you before I'd even met or talked to you, just by watching that TV show, is you take this subject very seriously. One of my abductees described me uh, when I was talking to a, 
uh, someone else about me that was interviewing him. He said, he said, what do you think of this guy? Is real or not? And he said, that guy's serious as a heart attack. Don't <laughs> yeah. you even kid yourself? And, and I am, and I appreciate your comment there. Uh, but the fact is that I am, uh, I am an investigator. I have, uh, uh, I have a policing background. Uh, I'm not a journalist per se. I'm not, uh, there's a lot of things I'm not, but one of the things I am is an investigator. And if it's real and, or if it's not real and I'm on the case, uh, I'm going to find out what it is, and somebody better be telling me the truth. Now, is uh, are there plans to do more episodes of Uncovering Aliens? Uh, thank you for asking. They've uh, just renewed my contract and uh, the, the other uh, stars of the show, uh, the four of us total, and uh, there appear to be uh, six to eight more shows that are going to be done. Excellent. Excellent. Well, like I said, I, I just thought the, the, the whole team structure just played very well. Uh, the gentleman from, uh, is he from the UK, I believe? That is correct, yes. Yeah, now what, what's his story? Because I'm not, I'm not too familiar with him. What, what's his he, background? He is, he's a contactee, and they like to push this. Uh, he's a contactee, meaning they, he thinks that they're here to save the planet, fix the ozone hole, and do wonderful things for mankind. And they're probably upgrading our DNA and doing all kinds of neat things for us that they don't want us to know about, but it's good for you. So just kind of... Kind of like the government. We're taking care of you. We're Anytime taking- the government knocks on my door and said, we're from the government here to help you, I'm sorry, I have a problem with that. <laughs> they haven't helped anybody yet. Now, so, uh, how, how did they come up with that team? How, how was that team constructed? Did did you put it together? Did the producers handpick these people or what? There were there were uh, seven of us originally that were of uh, uh, Flown to uh, the United Kingdom uh, to England, and uh, they and then after they interviewed us very carefully and ran us through a lot of tests and see how what we really know and what we really didn't know and so on. Then they then took us to the United States to work on a uh, a case in uh, Upper New York State, uh, very fascinating and a good case. And um, after that, then they made their decision from the seven people it would be these four, and. Um, so that's how we all came to be. And uh, one of them, like I say, is a contactee. Uh, the Stephen is the contactee. He's a really good guy. And uh, But he and I philosophically are just as far apart as uh, <laughs> yeah. the, one university is from another. <laughs> yeah, and you <laughs> can a, tell that. You can tell yeah, that on the show. A lovely guy. Well, they love that interaction. I'm an abductee, and I remember and I remember what happened to me, and I don't think that he does. I, I, uh, I, I just... Uh, Great group. So I, I'm glad to hear that there's more shows, more episodes coming. Uh, Daryl, is there anything else? Uh, I know uh, you you brought up your uh, website, which is alienhunter.org. What about any, uh, I believe you have something coming up later in the year, don't you? Some type of uh, um, MUFON event? Yeah, it's correct. I have a, a MUFON conference, and if you'll go to my website, alienhunter.org, uh, you'll be able to see that if the we got several things to add. I've got a MUFON conference in Pennsylvania I'll be speaking at in the latter part of the year. Uh, in September, I'll be going to uh, Canada, speaking up there. Uh, uh, um, uh, I'll be there uh, speaking uh, with several other speakers. Uh, Travis Walton and I will be the headliners for that conference. Uh, and I've got another conference I'll be speaking at as well. But all that will be uh, posted on the website very quickly. Uh, we've had a, bit, a few difficulties, glitches on the site, and they're working on that now. And uh, one of the things that is interesting to people, if you're an audience, if you have an interest in looking for evidence and you don't have an investigative background like me, or if you do, you want to investigate the alien thing, I have a book called AlienHunter.org, uh, excuse me, Alien Hunter, The Evidence in Light. And that book is basically a story of my life and how I came, how I became the alien hunter and how I found evidence and how you can find it. If you follow that book and follow each chapter, you'll be you'll be fascinated with the things you find in it. Uh, one uh, ex-intelligence guy said it scared the hell out of me. Uh, but the fact is, it's not meant to scare people. It's meant to show you what happens, what's real, and that you can find evidence that there is evidence we found on abductees and around abductees. And it's people just don't know how to look for it. If you use that book, you can do that. It's a lot of fun. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, Daryl, uh, thanks again for taking time out of your day to uh, to visit with us. I found it a fascinating conversation. Uh, 
good luck on, on the uh, uh, the TV show and the uh, speaking engagements and the books. Uh, it sounds like you got enough to keep you busy for a while. It, is, it does indeed, and I thank you so much. You've been a, a gentleman and a scholar. Thank you for bringing me on. All right, Joe. Well, thanks very much, and we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Bye-bye. The answer is to keep it.